It's the 1980s, a time when we were allowed to leave our homes. Today we're going to be talking about Chuck Peddle, the man, and the very brown computer. Chuck Peddle's not a household name, or at least in the same way that Jobs and Gates etc are. But he deserves far more recognition than he's got publicly, as his work has had a huge impact on the modern world of computing. For those of you aware of Chuck Peddle, it's probably due to his work on the 6502 microprocessor. Chuck headed up the design team of the 6502, which was hugely successful in the world of early computing. To give you some idea, it's the microprocessor inside the Atari VCS, the Apple II, the Commodore PET, the Commodore 64, the VIC-20, the BBC Micro, the Acorn Atom, the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Atari Lynx, the entire of the Atari 8-bit range, the Auric One, the Auric Atmos. That's not even an exhaustive list of the machines that that thing was in. In fact, the 6502 can be found inside modern systems as well, as a piece of embedded IP logic inside much larger ICs. In fact, take apart your modern Flash ATA drive and you'll find there, yeah, there's going to be a 6502. Chuck grew up on a farm in Maine, along with six other siblings. And while growing up, Chuck's great ambition was to become a radio announcer. But after having spent a while working at the high school radio station, Chuck realised there was a certain talent of presenting that he just did not possess. But it was suggested, that due to his technical abilities, that Chuck should take up engineering. Now, this stage, Chuck didn't know what kind of engineer he wanted to become. So when Chuck went to college, he took a degree in engineering physics. Chuck credited his primary motivation to go to college on the fact that before he'd gone to college, he'd worked pick and shovel, and had seen that people who kept doing that for most of their lives generally tended to not fare too well in later life. In an interview, Chuck stated that being at the dumb end of a shovel was really hard work, so therefore all the stuff that he did in later life did not feel like hard work in comparison. While at college, Chuck signed up for a module called Information Theory, taught by Claude Shannon, who is known for inventing both the words bit and byte. It was this module that set Chuck on the course that he'd spend the rest of his life following. From college, Chuck moved on to work for GE. Now, Chuck had many roles in GE. One of his first meant that he was involved in the team that was creating some of the very first hard disks. As part of that team, Chuck got a patent for inventing zone bit recording, which is a technique used in modern hard drives still to this day, and would be a technique that Chuck would later employ when working for both Commodore and Cirrus. After a number of roles inside GE, Chuck moved to their till and point of sales team. And while part of this team, he was approached by Exxon, who at the time was one of the largest operators of petrol stations in the US. Or gas stations if you're American, because... I still have no idea why you call them that. I mean, it's a liquid, not a gas. Yeah. But more to the point, Chuck designed a system for Exxon where instead of everything going back to a central mini computer somewhere, you had a certain amount of distributed intelligence on site, i.e. the till itself was actually a small computer that could handle information from the pumps and pass the display information out, as well as having a card reading machine. In other words, Chuck had basically come up with the way that all modern till systems work, but this time, yeah, it was just uniquely Chuck's idea at this point. He presented this to the board of GE, who then informed him that they were shutting down the computer division. So Chuck chose to take early retirement from GE and start his own business, producing the kind of till systems that he'd envisaged. With this new company, Chuck designed all the hardware he'd need for the tills and card readers, etc. However, he realised in order to be able to deliver this at an affordable price point, he was going to need LSI, large scale integration, to create the kind of processing elements that this system was going to need. LSI is basically what we think of as the modern microchip these days. And at the time that Chuck was looking into it, this was a very new technology. And more importantly, from Chuck's point of view, a very expensive technology. Now, if you've got to this point in the video, you're probably going to guess that this is not the sort of thing that Chuck was going to let stand in his way. No, Chuck came up with a plan. Chuck was going to go work for another company who had the kind of money that could do LSI and create the technology that he'd need for his own business. So Chuck headed off to Motorola. When Chuck joined Motorola, Motorola had already started work on one of the very first microprocessors, the 6800. Chuck joined that team, but the design was already well advanced by the time that Chuck became part of it. So the first idea that Chuck got to introduce to that processor was that of the non-maskable interrupt. This meant the processor would be able to do real-time operations because something could interrupt what the processor was doing and nothing else would be able to get in the way of that interrupt so you could handle some real-time data arriving at a particular moment in time. The other idea Chuck introduced was in the form of a separate chip called the PIA. Now this may actually be Chuck's biggest contribution to the world of modern computing. Even Chuck felt so, because this is basically how all modern memory mapped I.O. works. 
The PLI chip is essentially what mapped all input output into memory space so that the processor could deal with it. While Chuck came up with the idea, a fellow young engineer, Bill Minch, actually created all the hardware for this and did all the transistor logic. Remember that name, he's going to be quite important later on in this story. With the 6800 being one of the world's first microprocessors, there wasn't exactly a ready-made market just sitting there wanting to buy microprocessors. So Motorola had to get out there and start selling it to people. So that's what Chuck did. Motorola sent him out to large firms where he could sit and talk to their engineers and explain to them what the microprocessor is and how they could use it and a little bit of software to replace a lot of logic in designs that they were already doing. However, one of the bits of feedback Chuck kept getting from these engineers was that at $300, 6800 and its supporting chipset was far too expensive for them to use as a logic replacement in their designs. And also remember, this was $319.70. dollars that's, that's a lot of dollars in today's money. Yes, check out who couldn't be bothered looking that up in an inflation calculator. So armed with that knowledge, Chuck did what Chuck does, which is come up with an engineering solution to that problem. Yes, Chuck started working on a lower cost version of the 6800, talking to engineers about what functions of the chip they really needed and working out how he could shrink the die size. However, this did not go down well with the sales team of the 6800, who felt that Chuck's work was undermining them. They then sent a letter to Motorola's management, who decided to send a letter to Chuck, ordering him to stop all work on the new low-cost processor. Now, this is where Chuck was a bit canny. Lots of engineers would have just said, oh, well, fair enough, and got back on with the day job, but not Chuck. No, Chuck wrote the Milena back, and Chuck said he classed this as project abandonment, and that all the intellectual property developed so far would now become his property, and that he would continue developing this chip and doing no other development work for Motorola, but he would still go on the sales visits. Now, to be honest, if you or I tried to pull that trick, we'd probably get a letter that goes along the lines of, no. But this was Chuck, and Motorola, they agreed. So, Chuck started his own company and started to design a new processor. At the same time, Motorola wanted to move Chuck's team to Austin, Texas. And luckily for Chuck, quite a few of the good engineers did not want to live in Austin, Texas. So Chuck was able to poach them away from Motorola, including, of course, Bill Mensch. See, told you that name would be important in a moment. Now, with his design team in place for what would become the 6502, Chuck needed to find himself a silicon partner so he could get this thing made. Now, a former boss of Chuck's called John Paven had gone to work for a new silicon place in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, called MOS Technology. This should not, of course, be confused with Moss Tech, an entirely different company, which is the first one Chuck approached to partner up with. But they were afraid that Motorola would sue Chuck, and they didn't want to deal with Motorola. So with their new silicon partner in place, Chuck and team could get on with designing their processor, while their silicon partner got on with coming up with a new silicon process to produce this chip in. Between them, they also worked out the size of die they needed in order to hit the $5 mass manufacturing cost that they'd have to get in order to get this low-cost processor out to market. Chuck headed up this processor design team, while Bill Mensch did all the layout for the silicon and they designed their new processor, as well as their own version of the PIA, and also a timer chip as well. It would eventually become the VIA timer. So come 1975, MOS technology was able to unveil their brand new processor and chipset to the world, the 6501, a fully pin compatible replacement for the 6800. And then they were promptly sued by Motorola. Yep, turns out Mostech were right. Motorola was none too happy about there being a pin for pin like with their own chip, so they sued Moss Technologies, who soon decided that, okay, they'll change their chip. And then the 6502 was born. Now, in order to demonstrate the 6502, Chuck created his first ever computer, the Kim One. This was a single board machine with a hex keypad where you could enter data directly into RAM and then execute your program. It was a fairly simple affair, but it demonstrated the 6502 very nicely and was not much less sophisticated than most of the other microcomputers available at the time. It sold pretty well to hobbyists, but demonstrated the capabilities of the 6502, which led to other would-be computer designers wanting to lay their hands on the chip, including the likes of Steve Wozniak. It was during this period when working for Moss that Chuck persuaded then-Commodore boss Jack Tramiel to instead of resolving his supply issues for calculator chips with TI, to move into the computer business. After initially discussing purchasing Apple computers, Jack decided to go his own way and commissioned Chuck Peddle and team to design Commodore's first microcomputer, the Commodore PET. Originally produced in 1976, but made generally available in 1977, the Commodore PET was one of three significant computers released during that period of time. There was the PET, the TRS-80, and the Apple II. Of those three computers, Two of them were using the 6502 that Chuck Peddle designed. After Moss Technologies was taken over by Commodore, 
Chuck Peddle and Chris Fish, both from Moz, decided that they'd start their own computer company, Cirrus Systems Technology. They even got funding from John Paven, one of Moss Technologies' bosses, who'd made quite a bit of money when Moss had been sold to Commodore. It was at this company that Chuck designed his third computer, the beautiful lump of brown plastic you see in front of us. Yes, the Cirrus S1, or as it was known in Europe, the Victor 9000. I mean, just look at this thing. It's just so brown. Now, despite the fact that it had quite a 70s design aesthetic, for the time, this was a thoroughly modern microcomputer. Its design bears a number of similarities to that of the IBM PC, but of course it was no IBM PC clone. Whilst designing this thing, Chuck and team had no idea about the IBM PC or what shape it was going to come in, so they came to a lot of the same engineering decisions, but arrived at via their own path. In fact, in quite a few ways, the Victor 9000 is somewhat superior to IBM's offering. Now, obviously, you're not going to let me get away with a statement like that without justifying it in some way. But the main thing it had going for it, the cleverest feature of all, was that of its disk drive. With a five and a quarter inch drive, a regular PC could handle about 360k maximum on a floppy disk. Whereas the Victor 9000, well, on the same disk, it could get over a meg. Now, both sound like pathetically small amounts to us in this day and age, but over a meg of storage in the early 80s, well, that was quite a lot of storage on a single floppy drive. You could get some serious work done with that thing. As Chuck was fond of mentioning in various speeches, you could run a whole payroll department for like 10, 12 people on this thing. Which honestly was actually quite a big deal back then. I mean, it was all done by paperwork before computers. So yeah, this, this was a step up. It did not sell fantastically well in the US, but inside Europe, it, it sold well. I mean, look, here is it being used in Bergerac. I mean, nothing says success like being in an episode of Bergerac. It didn't just sell well on the Isle of Jersey. It actually did well in the UK and Germany and a number of other European territories. Again, one of its key appeals being that floppy disk drive system that we can see here in front of us. Now, electronically, this bears quite a lot of similarities to Commodore's disk drive design. Which shouldn't surprise you, because guess what? Yep, Chuck Pedal came up with that one. And he came up with this one. And it used the whole magnetic zone recording system he'd come up with while he was at GE. See, he told you that little fact would be useful later on. It's got a couple of other little quirks in its design. If you have a look around the back, you can see that the monitor has no power supply. That's because the display connector actually provides power into the monitor as well. Which is, well, kind of neat, to be honest. Now, the Victor 9000 was made available with both CPM and MS-DOS. And despite the fact that it ran MS-DOS, it was definitely not PC compatible. And when PCs landed in Europe, followed by the clones, the Victor 9000 was seen as more, well, just a not very good IBM PC clone by a number of people, which really started to hurt sales. Following the decline in sales, unfortunately, the Cirrus Computer Company went bust. But don't worry, that's not the end of the story for Chuck Peddle. As one of the final things he did as his career, Chuck came up with a, a new chip that would be used in modern flash drives. He created that chip with the Western Design Center, a company started by long-term colleague Bill Mensch. And it's even got a little 6502 embedded in it. So right up to the end, Chuck was still helping define the modern world in which we all live. Now I'd love to be able to show you this Victor 9000 all booted up and showing off its various operating systems. Unfortunately, I'm missing some discs for this thing. Um, and that these days is one of the problems with the clever, clever drive controller that made this thing a success in the first place. It's somewhat unique disc format. You see, the disc would run at different speeds depending on where the head was on the disc. Very few other computers did that, which means that these days I can't use a modern computer to write out that kind of disc. The only thing I can copy that sort of disc on is another Victor 9000 and well, and I'm not even allowed to leave the house to visit my parents, never allowing go find someone with a Victor 9000 and copy its boot discs. So I'm afraid this one's going to have to wait until we're all allowed back out of our houses again. And, you know, God knows when that's going to be. So unfortunately, it means that's it for this video. We have to leave it here. Once again, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to press the like button beneath it or share it with people you think might enjoy this video. Because there's very little point with sharing it with people who you don't think will. And if you're feeling so inclined, I would always appreciate someone subscribing to the channel because it really does make a big difference to small channels like this. And also, why not press the bell button so the subscribe button does the thing you thought it was going to in the first place? Because YouTube.